Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to another Porsche Cooled podcast, uh, the podcast where we talk about all things Porsche. Um, I'm Michael Barff. You guys know that already. Uh, today is the um, is an episode that I really enjoy doing, a podcast episode that I really enjoy recording, and this is Porsche Cooled Owner Stories. Uh, Porsche Cooled Owner Stories is where I chat to people around the world, people that own Porsches. Some might have one Porsche, some might have three Porsches. Uh, some, it may be their first, and some, it may be their 20th. Um, so this is the series that we've been doing on Porsche Cooled. Um, it's really, really great fun. I really enjoy it, and I've had a lot of uh, a lot of great feedback from it, and also a lot of support from people contacting me and wanting to be on it. So that's fantastic. So today we have um, we have I think a really special guest actually, and I have to say usually I have a little bit of background. I don't have a lot of background, and today I've got James coming from um, Australia, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, James and um, we haven't really spoken. We've just spoken briefly by Instagram through Instagram DM. And James has, it seems like he's owned a lot of Porsches over the years um, from his Instagram. So I'm, I'm interested to hear his story. And I think there's some, uh, there's some interesting bits which you guys will like, uh, things we haven't spoken about before. So I think it's going to be a good one today. Um, so let's get into it. I'm going to connect with, um, as usual, I'm going to connect with James uh, on Zoom. So I hope the quality is okay. I always say that, but it, it has been lately. Uh, so let me get uh, James on Zoom and let's start the Porsche Cooled Owner Stories. This is number eight. Do you believe it? We're up to number eight already. Um, so I'll get James on the line and we'll start talking Porsche. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the Porsche Cooled Podcast. Um, as I said, this is Owner Stories today, and I'm really looking forward to talking to our guest today. Uh, we have James uh, from Melbourne, and James has a, uh, he has a long history with Porsche. I don't know all of his story. I've only known what I've seen on, on his Instagram account and what he's just told me briefly now. So, James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. How is it in Melbourne? Are you all out of, um, you're all out of lockdown now? Uh, well, we have some freedoms, but we'll be, uh, I think, off the leash tonight or tomorrow morning. Oh, tomorrow morning. So it's been a few weeks, hasn't it? Uh, it's been a very long one. Um, we've been in lockdown for essentially almost seven months, um, but a lot more freedoms tomorrow. Oh, a that's lot, good. Lot yeah. So you can get out in the Porsches. Absolutely. We can go for drives. Um, the 25-kilometre limit on where we could drive to has been lifted, so... Oh, fantastic. That's a good thing, and yeah, a lot yeah. of guys are looking forward to it. Fantastic. Um, so Porsche Cooled Owner Stories, we usually start it. I mean, Porsche Cooled Owner Stories, I do this this uh, this segment on the podcast um, because I think it's really good because I'm not I'm not a Porsche expert, James. I'm just a, I'm just an enthusiast. Um, you, are, I just own a 997. Uh, we do the other podcast on Fridays with Steve, and that's where we just sort of chat about all things Porsche. Um, but this is to get... Uh, you know, owners' insight and other people's experience and other people's you know views on on owning the brand and being in the brand and and enjoying the brand. So that's kind of what it's all about. Um, so I think the best way to start, because I'm interested as well, is um, Porsche. What is your first memory of seeing your first Porsche or Porsche? What is your first memory? Uh, my first memory would have been uh, I was playing soccer as a as a young boy. Um, and my coach had a, I think it was like an impact bumper, so a, maybe a mid seventies or late seventies uh, nine eleven Targa. Right, beautiful. Um, and I remember getting ferried around in the back of that Targa to a, a few of the, the soccer games. Um, so it was a, you know, it was like a lime green Targa. Oh, okay. It was just just a beautiful car, and had the, I still remember it. it had the. Um, I think like a, a creamy colour or a tan, a tan coloured interior. Just yeah, sitting in the back of that seat, probably at the age of I don't know, seven, eight years old, something like that. Um, that was my first memory. So that was it. After that, you were hooked. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, after that, uh, one of the family members um, had a nine thirty turbo, a oh, silver nine thirty turbo, and that was just yeah. <laughs> So you were well, still a, you were see. still a kid when they had that. You were still you were still a kid, or yeah, did you get yeah. the opportunity to drive it? No, no, certainly didn't get the opportunity. I was probably you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere there. Um, never got the opportunity to drive that one, um, but always interested in in Porsches because of the shape, because of the sound, and I, I've always been drawn to them. Um, and then, of course, their their racing pedigree. Always wanted always wanted to be part of that. 
we'll get into that actually because that's 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 something I really want to talk about. So, yeah. when you get in a Porsche today, do you think back to those times when you were a ten year old and eight year old and getting into that first one of your soccer coach and the and the turbo? Does it actually take you back? Is that you know how people say that's why they buy a classic, right? Because it takes you back and it makes you remember clearly. Well, I mean, in, in with some of the some of the cars I've owned. It, it has done that, particularly the, the Targa that had the same colour interior, um, but not generally. I mean, you know, I, I get in them now. I just enjoy them for what they are. But, you know, there, there were glimpses maybe years ago when, when I first, you know, bought my, 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 my first 911. Let's, let's, let's go to that, actually. Let's jump to that. So yep. you, you, you saw them as a kid. You thought, you thought I'm going to get one. That was it. I'm going to buy a Porsche. One yeah, day. absolutely. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like the the typical teenage boy that has the posters on the wall. I had those posters, um, you know, of the slant nose nine elevens and um, yeah, nine thirty yeah. turbos and things like that, and um, whatever else was going on in magazines that you'd pull out the centre page. That wasn't a Porsche, of course, and you know they were on the wall. They were always. <laughs> yeah, it was something about the shape, wasn't it? That's what it was always about. Uh, yeah. that, that shape, yeah. that those lines, yeah. are just just you know. Um, so. Let's jump forward a few years. Sure. When when you had the means to do it, what was the first what was the first nine eleven that you bought or the first Porsche that you bought? And what was the reasoning behind buying that that in particular model? Was it price? Was it was it because you really wanted it or what was the reasoning? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start with the reasoning. The reasoning obviously was the price. Okay. Um, having wanted a, a nine eleven for, for so long and never been able to afford one at an early age, of course. Um, I got the opportunity to buy a 911 SC. Okay. Beautiful. So it had been uh, imported from Japan. Um, it was it was fairly cheap uh, at that sort of time. Um, I think I paid twelve thousand dollars for a 911 SC. It was a white car. Um, that's quite a few years ago now. Um, yeah, and that was just an absolute beautiful car, and it needed work. You know, you'd expect a car. Uh, that was that cheap to 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 need some work, so yeah. um, it ended up ended up needing a top end rebuild. Um, right. Had it had, uh, I think it was some pulled head studs or broken head studs. Um, so we spent probably the equivalent amount just doing a, a quick refresh on the top end. Um, and yeah, that was my first nine uh, eleven. So what? So this is going back. Would this be in the nineties when you bought this car? Uh, Probably early 2000s. Early 2000s. So it was, it's still, I'm trying to remember from importing cars into Australia from Japan. Importing cars from Japan is quite easy, right? Into Australia or not? Uh, yeah, look, it, there, there's many of them here. And I think in the 90s and 2000s, they were just, they were just flooding. You know, they were everywhere. Um, they were flooding the market. Uh, there were, you know, all the Japanese makes, of course, that were here. Yeah. Uh, all the imported you know, Japanese makes, and then of course the the Porsches were there, and BMWs, and whatever else. Yeah, I noticed recently. Uh, I think a 911 came up that was sold out of Japan. I think there's one on car sales. I don't know if it was a green one or there, there was one I noticed recently that it said it was an originally a Japan car. I think it was a Sporto, Sporto, and it was changed over to manual or something like that. It's just oh, recently. Oh, that yes, yeah, the I know. Vi- the green, almost like Viper the green, green color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I saw yeah. that recently, and it was a Japan so car. So my car was basically that, but in white. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so when you said, um, so you bought that car and you said you did a, a, a top end rebuild. So you do the work on the cars yourself, James? Um, I, I do a lot of work of the work on the cars myself, but not that in depth. Um, right. When it, when it came to the engine side of it, I, I gave it over to uh, some good friends of mine, uh, Fitzgerald Racing Services. Oh, okay. Uh, that are, that are close to me. Okay. Um, I you know worked alongside them in in a in a customer team that they were looking after. Okay. Um, so I gave them the, the job and we got that done and, yeah, I enjoyed that car for, for quite a few years. It was probably the longest ownership I've had of Porsche and um, I don't seem to hold them that long anymore. So how long did you own that one for? <laughs> uh, that was probably close to eight years, eight, eight ten years, somewhere there. I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I think it was – Sorry, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a lovely ownership because what made it so good? It was relatively cheap Porsche, and nobody sort of cared about them. And mm. um, you know, you drive it anywhere, park it anywhere, and nobody really cared about it. It was a, a relatively cheap Porsche, and it was, a, it was just a lovely thing to drive. 
Yeah, even even in Australia, even I can remember even in around 2004, they were still quite cheap, all the air cools, weren't they? Yeah. Like 2003, 2004, and then, it, then a few years later, it, it just started to go up. It just started to go crazy. Because I remember seeing, you know, G50s and stuff for like twenty three, twenty five, twenty seven thousand dollars $27,000, you know, probably not good condition, but I remember seeing them for sale. Yeah, yeah, they were certainly around at that sort of price. And um, once the market started moving so much is, is basically the reason I sold it um, and to, to allow me to move into another one. Um, so after that car, you had it for eight years. Um, I know what that's mm-hmm. like. You get your first 911. I'm still on my first 911, believe it or not, and I've still got it after four years. Um, but I'm getting <laughs> itchy. I need something else. I need yeah. something extra, something to add to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you What did you do next? So you sold it. You made some money on that car, obviously, because air cooled prices were on the rise. Um, yes. And you gave it up. And what did you get into after that, James? Uh, a 993 Carrera. Oh, beautiful. So, so that was a 95 model, um, just a Carrera 2. Um, it was a Tiptronic because, uh, again, the difference between the Tiptronic price and the manual price was you know, probably twenty, thirty thousand at that stage. Yeah. So um, I bought the Tiptronic and uh, had that for a couple, couple more years. And how did you and, find uh, the Tiptronic going from the air cooled? Air cooled was a manual, obviously, and then you went from yeah. air cooled manual into air cooled automatic. Um, I didn't mind it so much because I was using it as a daily car where I could. Um, I, I quite enjoyed the car. Yeah, it wasn't. It was a bit sluggish in in certain you know, certain parts of the rev range, um, and it wasn't obviously a, the latest, you know, automatic gearboxes where they just change in an instant. Yeah. Um, but I still enjoyed it for what it was because I was just happy to be an owner of that type of car that I almost couldn't afford. You know, it was um, it was it was again quite a cheap car. It, it it had been on the market for quite a while and, you know, had a few oil leaks, so we fixed those up. And I think what you're saying, though, is a good point, though. You know, but for people who are, who are waiting for their first 911, who are wanting to get their first 911, yeah. people wait too long. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can wait yeah. and wait and wait for the ideal one. But like you said, you know, and I've had this conversation even with other people as well. You know what I mean? Like they've bought the Tiptronic because they wanted their wife to drive it, like uh, Andrew yes. that was on one of the previous stories. Um, and also Connor that's coming up on this week's one. Um, he had the same situation. He bought a Tiptronic uh, PDK 997. And it's the reasoning behind it. But also the other reasoning, as you said, it, it's price. You know what I mean? In the beginning, you want to get into the brand. You want to drive the brand. Um, and the fact that you've got a 993 is still pretty damn exciting. You know, yeah, does it matter yeah. that it's a Tiptronic? You're still enjoying the brand. You're still experiencing that model. And I think that's what, you know, you can't sort of wait too long for these things, too, can you? Especially with Porsche, with prices just going up so crazy all the time. Yeah, I mean, prices move so quickly now with Porsches and, and obviously as the years go by, you you kind of think back and say, well, you know, maybe I should have done this or I should have done that. And I always take the approach, if you can do something, do it now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that car was a beautiful car. It came to a very sad end though. It uh, really? caught fire and burnt, burnt to the ground. Oh, really? The, in the, the yeah. next owner? Next ownership or your no, ownership? No, no, with, with my ownership. Oh, so, so tell us um, that story, yeah. Oh, one night, I, th- I think I had owned the car for about three or four years at that stage, and uh, I, one night just driving home, it uh, decided just to literally explode in flames, you know, from the rear. and Really? Took, took off from a set of lights just around the corner from my house and just this massive trail of flame and, yeah, it was wow, over. That, that would have been frightening? Yeah, it was definitely frightening. I mean, I obviously knew what exactly what was going on and basically just pulled over, turned it off, stepped out of it and walked away and then kind of realised. So what, complete, completely burnt to the ground? Uh, not completely burnt to the ground, but basically the rear end. I mean, all the engine, everything was melted and um, the fire brigade got there pretty quickly. But, so uh, what was the cause of that? Did you ever find out? Uh, apparently a fuel leak. So the insurance company did an investigation and said there was something wrong with the fuel, one of the fuel lines or something like that. So, um, yeah, basically I never saw that car again. And, wow. So that was the end uh, of that one. So, so this is a car that's been well-maintained. I guess you, you maintain your cars, right? So it's a well-maintained yeah. car and it's, and it's still, yeah. you know, these things can happen. This is, this is the reason why you have a fire extinguisher in your, in your Porsche. Even so, that wouldn't have helped you, right? I don't think that would have, you know, a small fire extinguisher would not have got that fire out. I mean, it happened so quick and it was just so 
there was just so much fuel everywhere. I mean, there was traces of fuel running down the road. Wow. That's so scary. something let something had let go pretty quickly and um yeah, anyway, so the fire brigade came along, put it out, and they said, Oh, this is quite common. I said, oh, okay, great. Wow. But anyway. So the so that's the end of the nine nine three Tiptronic. Yep. You get the insurance money and you think, okay, I've got to get another one. What's yep. next? So a couple of days after that had happened, I was uh, looking at an auction site, mm-hmm. and I found I found myself a damaged 997 GT3, and it was damaged, so you, it couldn't go uh, back on the road. It, uh, you couldn't re-register it or re-license it. Right. Um, so I used that as a track car. I, I repaired the car myself. It cost me about seven thousand dollars to repair it myself. Um, some of the laws in Australia are, are quite crazy. When it comes to insurance write-offs, uh, so anyway, we I bought I got that car, um, repaired it over a, a few months, um, got the parts from various places, mainly in the US. I got the, the parts, um, repaired that, and used that for a track car for about four years. So, this this car was just damaged. The body was just damaged, or there was engine damage, or it was a side uh, hit. Or- this is the white no, just, one, is it, James? This is the white one that was on your Instagram? No, or? blue. It's a blue 997 GT3. I'm that's, just looking at your, okay, the blue one. Yeah, there was a, not, not the race car that was uh, got all the graphics on it. Yep, yep. Um, I'm going to ask you about that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the 997 GT3 was basically my first you know, good track car. Um, but in the meantime, I'd owned a whole bunch of Porsches in between all that as well. Um, and during the ownership of that 997. But, yes, I, I repaired it, used it as a track car just in, um, you know, Porsche Club uh, sprint days um, right. with, with other friends of mine that have similar cars. And, so was that, was that your introduction to track days? Was that the first time you started doing track days after you bought this GT3? No, no, definitely not. Um, my track days go back to the early 90s okay, as, so a really, you... as a really young kid. <laughs> As a young kid. Um, so let's talk about that. That's because of your background. You have background in racing. So just tell the listeners yes. a little bit. So during this period, you're buying these Porsches, but you are actually also involved in, in racing in Australia. Um, I don't That's know whether right. it was always with Porsche. Was it always with Porsche or was, did it start somewhere else? No, it started with um, the, the classic Mini Cooper. Okay. Um, so I, and that was literally my first car. It was a 1964 Mini Cooper um, that I had, built up from essentially a rolling shell, okay. rolling chassis. I prepared that car for track days and, and I was part of the mini club back then um, and started doing, uh, you know, track days through the year. Had that car for, you know, a whole bunch of years and then sold that and um, then I started racing what's called a Mitsubishi Mirage Cup car. Yes. Um, also known as a Colt. Uh, yep. in other parts of the world. So that was a factory-built race car. I had that and raced that here in uh, Victoria in what's called improved production. Okay. Um, but that's a proper racing category. Um, so you're in, you're in amongst all the, the big V8s and BMWs and all these other cars, and it just works off uh, your engine size, basically. Okay. When, so you're racing, the, when you're racing the Mirage, do you still – you? Are you a Porsche owner at that stage when you're doing the racing, or this is pre? Yeah, I, I did have the 911 SC at that stage. You had the yeah. SC. Okay, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the first one, yeah. So I, I ended up winning, um, this is probably mid-2000s, I ended up winning the Victorian um, uh, the Victorian state title in the class. All right, fantastic. Um, so not, not outright, but in its category, I, yeah, I yeah. won that. Um, then sold that car off um, and just kept, you know, just kept my interest in, in the 911s really. So then um, but, the, Mir- the Mirage goes, you get the GT3, and then you start tracking the GT3. Yeah, there was a big – there was probably a 10-year gap between the, the Mirage and the GT3. So okay. I, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd not gone to the track for literally, you know, nine to ten years um, at, at that one stage, which is, you know, it is pretty typical. A lot of guys step in and out of it. Um, oh. But, yeah, you know, I certainly got back into it when I picked up that GT3 and – you know that four. You know that takes us literally four to ten years. Um, so the the GT three was with Porsche Club of Victoria, or Porsche Club of Victoria, was it, or just events right. that they're that's doing correct. and just doing yep. you know those sort of days that they organise, like Porsche Club of New South Wales does those sort of race days and. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And how was the results yes. in the GT three? 
Um, really good. I think I ended up winning a championship one year. Actually, I did. I did, yeah, yeah. I won one of the years I had enough points to win the championship in its category again or in its class, not outright. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I quite enjoyed it, but it did come to the, the point of I was – I was probably out driving the car. I didn't, um, and, and how I can say that is, you know, it probably needed more suspension work or, you know, different tyres and whatever it was. I, I'd like to keep the car standard. So once I sort of re- reached the limit of the car, I'd, you know, sell it and move on and buy something better. And I, and I certainly did. I ended up buying a uh, 2004 uh, 996 GT3 Cup car. So is this the famous one? This is the one that... With all the livery on it, yeah, the blue one. So it's a uh, it was it was uh, Jonathan Webb's uh, uh, Carrera Cup car okay. from his two thousand four two thousand five season. Yeah, um, quite a quite a lovely car, and happened to chance a bonnet, and um, you know a miraculous story how we ended up buying it, and then how we found out its history and so on. Um, but yeah, basically. It was a what, an ex- what year was this, James? Sorry, what year was this? How when long I ago? bought that one, uh, I think 2015, 2016. Okay, and this That's followed not, not this long, followed yeah. the other GT3 that you repaired, or there was some. This was the next yeah, no, race I, car. I'd sold I'd sold that off, and then that was the next race car. Okay, um, sorry. I think I think I owned them for a bit as an overlap, maybe for a year, but I did eventually sell off the the GT3 um, road slash track car. Are you okay for people to go to your Instagram, James? Yeah, absolutely. Not okay, so all. I'll just just while James is talking, and if you and if you're listening to this, you you can just have a look at it while we're talking. If you go to Porsche Porsche or Porsche Platz P L A T Z, um, if you go to I'll put it in the link of the podcast. But if you go to um, James's Instagram, he's got a lot of photos of the, of cars he's owned, and, and this car is actually on there. And this car is I've seen this car I've seen this car before. I saw it in an article. It, when I saw it on your Instagram, I remembered that I'd seen it and it had something to do with uh, when Porsche was celebrating. You know, I remember seeing it in some article that I read on Porsche's website. So, but I'll let you tell yeah. the story yeah. about this car, James. Um, well, the way, the way I found the car was it was basically at a car dealer's auction. So where the car dealers dispose of their used cars. Okay. Quite a bizarre place to find a Carrera Cup car. Mm. Um, and essentially no one knew its history no one knew anything about it, so it was an unknown quantity. I jumped on the phone to a good mate of mine, Andy, uh, who we used to work together in Porsche race teams, um, and I said, mate, let's get down to this place on Monday, have a quick look at it, see what it is, um, because we, we used to work on these cars. Okay. Um, which is probably another story we could jump yeah, we, to. Yeah, we um, want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we, we went down, had a quick look at it. The car had gone to auction for two or three times and been passed in, never met reserve. Um, and I basically just said to the, the auctioneer, I said, uh, look, mate, I want to come down and have a look at it. This is my history with these type of cars. Um, I'm going to bring some fuel and a battery and see if I can get it running and then we can work a deal out. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, is something that's something that they never allow. They never allow people to go in the yards and, you know, look at the cars and play with them or do anything like that. So we went down, sure enough, put some fuel in it, put a battery in it. The car started, stopped immediately, but we knew that the engine was there, everything was there Um, because you've got to remember there was zero history with this car. Yeah. And and no one knew a thing about it. So anyway, did a deal. I was very happy with the deal I did. Um, It was quite cheap for one of those cars. Um, Took it back to uh, Andy's workshop and um, basically replaced the fuel pump and – fired up and that was it it was just a beautiful so there was car. nothing wrong with the car mechanically it was pretty pretty good um well believe it or not it had a brand new cup car engine in it like a literally so, brand spanking new so it, it goes to auction it gets passed in people don't buy it is that because people in australia don't want to buy an x race car is that what it is because it's a race car or because of the price because i see some no. of these cars come up and they're quite high you know when they when they do come up yeah what yeah. do you think was no, the reason? It, it, the reason is no one knew its history and if you're buying a race car that, that nobody knows any history about all, I mean, for all we knew, it may have had no engine internals. Right. It may have had no, no gearbox in it. Um, but allowing the auctioneer allowing us to actually physically go and look at it and inspect it, obviously, you know, if you don't ask, then you don't know. Yeah, yeah. 
So when so you bought we, this, we went there. Mm, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we went there, inspected it, which is something they don't usually allow. So when you bought this car, did you realize mm-hmm. how special it was? Um, the or did it take a while once a few, you started talking to people? No, a few days later, um, within a week, we kind of worked out what exactly we had. Um, a few phone calls. Uh, my friend Andy knew the previous owners. We didn't know who owned the car at the time, but once we worked out whose car it was, so you know, it it, came, it, it became very apparent really quickly that it was a mega mega dollar car and. A lot of money was spent on it, and the thing was literally brand new. So tell the listeners, why is this car so important? Just just give a brief brief um, rundown of why well, it was so important. In, in Australia, there was the, the Carrera Cup Championship started in 2003 in Australia. There were around the 25 cars brought into the country from, you know, Porsche organised that. Yes. And then in 2004, Porsche brought in an additional five cars. Okay. This is one of those five cars. So it was the latest and greatest in the 996 Cup car you could get in Australia at the time. Um, it was used in the Carrera Cup Championship and finished third in the championship at, in one year and I think sixth or fifth or sixth in the next year. Okay. Um, and then the car literally never saw daylight again since its last race. But I think a couple of months before its last race, the owners of that car spent roughly around $200,000 maintaining it and literally gave it a birthday and made everything brand new in it. Okay. So I so ended brand, up... brand new engine? Brand, brand new engine. I, I ended up getting the receipt for it. Wow. It was, I think, 55000 Australian dollars at that, t- at that stage. And, yeah, basically it was a, a brand new car. Um, through a few different owners, all the history gets lost. Nobody knows what it is. You know, the price obviously keeps decreasing on, on these cars and it gets to a point where they, they shoot this, back up. But this is where dealers and auction houses, you know, they should do their research, right? If they did their research properly and didn't just, you know, what? this is the problem, isn't it? It's like that you've got something that's quite important and, and probably worth more than what you paid for it. You probably got a good price because of that. It's just yeah, like you yeah. think, why didn't they just do their research? Well, I, I, well... I'm quite convinced that the seller didn't even know what he was selling. Wow. Let alone let alone the auction house. And you must remember these auction houses don't deal with race cars. They just deal with your everyday, you know, road going cars. Yeah, true. And if they're if they're selling, who knows, thousands of cars per week, they're not gonna bother with one race car. So, so you, um So you got yeah. this nine nine six cup car, the blue one. Yes. And then you take it to the track, you start racing it? Yeah, I, I use that car for two years I think you know I did probably 12 or 13 I don't know 11 track days I did in that car um, and then started realizing the value of these things um, I had the car restored as well uh, when I say restored we put the the, the livery and the, yep. the signage back on it yep which the car great. certainly didn't need the car certainly didn't need restoring no um, uh, and then uh, that's I think Porsche Cars Australia were looking for uh, a 996 Cup car for their 70th anniversary celebrations at the uh, Formula One Grand Prix in Melbourne. Yes. Uh, in 2018. Um, so, you know, I sent them a few photos. Um, you know, the call out was made. So I sent them a few photos and they said, yep, we definitely want your car. Um, I had the car, you know, they came and picked up the car and put it on display and. You know, they, they certain, certainly treated me well with all their corporate hospitality, which was quite nice. That's good. Ended up doing a couple of laps of the track at very low speed, which was, I must say, a little bit boring. But yeah. I still appreciate the uh, the chance just to be on the Formula One circuit, even though we couldn't drive more than 100 kilometres an hour. Must be some insurance thing or something. But Yeah, yeah. that's annoying, isn't it? Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity, um, but it would have been nice to, to have a bit of a go about it. But anyway, that's so. Fine. So now you've got this 996 Cup car. It's, yep. it's been on display for Porsche's 70th anniversary. Uh, yep. You've got all the history sorted. You know what the history is. Yep. You can tell people the history. Do all of a yep. sudden you start getting – do people start sending you emails and saying, I'm interested in buying your car. Do I want to take that car off your hands? And not just locally, globally. Are there people out there that, that are searching for these cars? Yeah, yeah, there are. There are. So, um, you know, I had a few, few inquiries um, on the car. Um, I ended up posting it on Renlist, 
yes. over in the US yep. and ended up selling it to a guy on Renlist. So the car's over in Michigan now. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, was it yeah, hard? Look, it was, was it hard to part with that car? In, in one way it was, but in another way it allowed me to obviously go and buy some more. Um, so, you know, it's always that story, you know, do you keep your car or do you sell it and buy something else? I mean, I'd, I'd experienced the car for two years. I had done all the track days I'd wanted to do on it. I'd restored the car with its livery and, you know, it had featured in a couple of Porsche, um, you know, a couple of Porsche events. Um, so it was a well-publicized car and, uh, yeah, basically. It was, but it was a it was an enjoyable ownership period, wasn't it? I mean, that's that's what it's oh, all absolutely. about. You know that yeah. you know to have yeah. that story that people don't have, and it's and you know you find something, and it feels like there's a trend here, James. It feels like you're very good at mm. finding bargains that are, that yeah. are sort of there oh, on the surface oh. that people don't see, and then you pick them up, and <laughs> then you then you get then you sell them after having you know a few years of enjoyment, and then it's the next one, the next big one. Um, yeah, I, I just want to ask one question about the cup car, actually, because I'm interested. The cup sure. car and your regular GT3, the GT3 that you fixed up for the track. Yes. How is how would you explain to our listeners what uh, what the difference is on the track? What is the difference between a cup car and that GT3 that you that you just fixed up and re- and made better? Okay, so basically, the road going GT3 in in complete road form. Um, even if you've got the R-Spec tyres, fine. But essentially a, a road-going GT3, it is, a, it is a soft car on the track. Okay. It certainly, it certainly goes quick. It will do everything you want. But once your experience level as a driver increases, you will outdrive the car. Okay. Um, and I'm talking of the 996, 997 era. Um, I'm sure the 991s, 992 GT3s are, a, you know, the bar is raised a lot higher. Yes. But the, the 996, 997 era, I mean, a, a, a driver that's had a bit of experience um, or, you know, a decent amount of experience on the track will, will outdrive that car in its stock form. Okay. Um, so I found, it, I found it as a – it's a good safe car to use when you're learning. Um, it may – you know, it's probably not the best car to have as your first track car. Yeah. But certainly as maybe your second or third track car, it, it's a good thing. Um, but once you – Reach its um, reach its limit. Yes, um, you can you can basically move on to a cup car if you want to do that. So the, the basic differences are it's it's a soft version of a cup car. Okay, so is the cup car so the cup car is closer to a RS a GT3 RS? Uh, as a I know you, it's not, your, yeah. If someone's racing, you're talking a road going RS. Yeah, the road going. No, no, it's even above that. So if someone's racing a, a GT3 and they go, would they – if you're saying someone's racing a GT3, they get a GT3 and they find their experience has got so great that it's not doing it for them anymore, do they, yep. do they then buy a GT3 RS, 997 GT3 RS, and, and use that on the track or they really should be looking at cup cars? Is that how it no, works? They, yeah, they really should be looking at a cup car. I mean the, the difference between the, the, the standard GT3 and the GT3 RS is not that great. Okay. Okay, um, that's what I thought. I just wanted to. It's, it's just... really not that great for an experienced driver. It's not that great at all. Sure, the RS is going is going to be faster. It may do certain things better, but um, once you step into a cup car, everything happens a lot lot quicker. So okay, you know things are blink of the eye stuff, um, and you've got to be mentally prepared for that. Right. You you can you can obviously corner a lot faster, brake a lot faster, accelerate a lot faster. And you can make mistakes a lot faster. A lot faster. <laughs> okay. So they get to a point where if it's like a linear curve, you can fall off that curve very quickly on, yes. a, on a cup car, whereas a, a, a road-going GT3 will give you some, some comfort at the top there and save you a little bit here and there. And you really have to be silly to, you know, to, to, to basically make a mistake and crash the thing. Um, if, if you're experienced. Right. And I see a lot of people, and maybe this is just Porsche Club in New South Wales, when I see things they send through, a lot of people get a Boxster and they start with a Boxster as a track car. Is that, yeah. a, is that a good track car? Is that just when you're really purely learning? Because to me, it, it seems a bit weird that you would use a Boxster as a track car. No, no. The, the, the Boxster is, is, is quite a good car. There's, is um, 
you know, a well-balanced car. They, they may not have uh, a load of horsepower, but it's, it's a very good car to learn with. I mean, if you're starting out for track days, a box is probably going to be one of the best things. Okay. Number number one thing is it's obviously going to be a lot cheaper than a 911. Yes. Um, and you can make small improvements like suspension and, and obviously tyres and brakes, of course, um, and, and really enjoy it and just learn track craft, um, you know, learn how to drive. I mean, the, the biggest mistake some people make is buy, you know, big horsepower cars and get out to the track and, and they're the ones that, crash them and say, well, that's the guy you don't want to be. Mm, mm. But, um, yeah, people starting out in, in the Porsche world, if they're, you know, buy a cheap Boxster and, and you know, thrash it to death and if you bin it, well. See if you like it, and, it and, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. a good one. Um, so you've got this, you've got the cup car. During the cup yes. car, I'm sure you've got your personal cars that you own, the, the, the Porsches. Yes. What, are you, what are you driving on the street during that time? Uh, I think at that time I had um, I had some really special cars actually, uh, and probably one of my favourites. So I had a 1976 uh, three liter Carrera. Okay. And also at the same time I had a 1976 uh, 930 Turbo, the three liter version. Yes. Yes. Um, so the three liter Carrera was a Japanese car, um, left hand drive, so that was fine in Australia, but it was literally like stepping into a brand new car the, the car had spent so many years in someone's private collection um i think over there like their private collections are basically called museums for tax purposes yeah um but it had spent so many years in someone's private collection and had very low kilometers so that car was essentially a brand new car um and it was just just beautiful like you know Smelt brand new, felt brand new, everything was new on it. Um, and then also had the 930 Turbo. And the 930 Turbo was as good as what everyone says it is or better? Um, is well, that hard to drive? Yeah. I keep hearing these things people say it's very no, hard to drive. No. no, no, they're not hard to drive. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's, your, it's what you do with your accelerator that, that makes it hard or not. <laughs> um, you can drive that around as an everyday car. Um, I know one guy that's had his 930 Turbo for like 18 years, that's daily. Wow. Um, but, yeah, the, the 930 Turbo, if you, and this goes with literally any car, if you're silly with the car and, and start abusing it, well, it, it's probably going to bite you. Um, but if you just drive it with respect, it's, it's fine. And, sure, you can give it plenty of, plenty of squirt down the, you know, the freeway entrance ramp and see, it pushes see. you back into the seat. James, you're living, you're living, you're really living the Porsche life here. You know, people are going to be listening to this saying, you've got this cup car, this got this 996 cup car, you're on the track, you know, you know how to drive it. And then on the road, you've got the, the, the turbo, you know, you've got two classic, you know, 70s, 911s. Um, yeah. It yeah. must be a good feeling. You must be like driving sometimes and going, wow, this is, this is fantastic. You know, how did I get here? Oh, look, it, a, a lot of the, a lot of the cars I've owned is because the previous car, was sold for a good amount of money to buy the next one. Yeah. Um, most of these cars that I've owned, I mean, I only started with a very small amount of money, but most of these cars have just been built up by selling the previous one. And in some cases, there was an overlap where the owner hasn't picked up the car for six months and says, I can drive it and do whatever I want with it. Yeah. Sure. Um, but most cases, it was, yeah, I'd buy one car, the prices would increase and, at that time here in Australia, you know, the, probably 2015 or 2014 all the way up until even recent times, the values have just been going crazy. And, yeah, they you have. Know, I, I would find a car that's, that's, you know, that was a really good price and buy it and, you know, never get a PPI. Just, just buy the thing and just enjoy it because you're buying them at a good price and, you okay. know, you're, you're putting in a bit of risk factor there and, but yeah, the, the Carrera 3 was a very expensive car to, that I even bought. I mean, I sold that car to, to a guy in California. Didn't make much money on it, but right. um, at, le at least it certainly covered costs. That was the, sorry, the, the one from Japan was the, the 930 or the Carrera 3? No, the, the Carrera 3 was from Japan. Carrera 3. And, okay. I, and I ended up selling that to a, a guy in um, California. Is... Um, 
is Japan still a good market for people that want to buy these these special 911s? Like the you know, is that still a, it, a viable market, or the price has gone crazy there? The the prices have gone crazy crazy in Japan, no, no doubt about it. Um, I mean, it, it, the rest of the world went crazy. It was only a matter of time before Japan caught up. Yeah. The good thing about the Japanese market is the cars are uh, are very good condition. You will always find. You know, um, it doesn't go for everything, of course, but most of the most of the time, the cars are very well looked after. Um, you know, and, and that's pretty typical of, of the Japanese market. So, um, yep. yeah, the advantage of buying a car from Japan is, you know, generally you'll end up with something good, but that's not the rule in all cases. But you know, it, it does help. Yeah, because a lot of the cars have limited limited kilometers, right? Limited miles on them. They're yeah. not really heavily yeah. driven cars in Japan, so that's always the bonus. Isn't it? It's always yes, a bonus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you had. So you've got. You got the nine six. The, the nine nine six cup car. You've got these two seventies nine elevens. So then you yeah. sell them pretty much the same time. You sell them all around the same time, or you. Yeah, within. Um, no, within you know a year or a year and a half spacing there. And then um, what? Hap- then what happens? You've got this big bundle of cash, James. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Not really. But you go. I've got all this cash. What can I get now? Um, what did I buy? I think I ended up buying another nine thirty turbo, uh, another three liter car at that stage. Australian car? No, it was it was an American uh, American car that was converted to right hand drive. Okay. Um, the you know again that was a lovely car and I enjoyed it, but it was pretty much the same as the first one. Um. So ended up selling that. Probably didn't make any money on that, but that doesn't matter. Um, at least it, it recouped. It's you know what I put, what I paid for it. Um, what did I buy after that? I, I kind of forgotten now. Um, I, I ended up. I did. Mm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you get another GT3? Was there another yeah, GT3? So, there is another GT3 oh, coming up, right? Because I think I saw something in it. Yeah. Was it a yellow car? No. Um, I think the yellow car. If that's on my Instagram, yeah, yeah it I'm, is. I'm looking at your Instagram. That was that was one that I immediately tried to buy after the blue cup car. Okay, but someone decided to screw me over on that deal. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, so, I've got enough experience in buying and selling cars, but yeah. So, it, so that was a bad experience. Well, bad experience from the person that was initiating the sale. The um, the sale wasn't happening through the owner; it was happening through. Uh, someone looking after the car. Oh, okay. I understand. And, uh, yeah, I think his interests were outweighing where that car was going. Yep, yep. We've got a lot of 911s here. Have you owned a transaxle, transaxle Porsche? Have you owned a 924 or a 944? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, I've I actually, owned, do, uh, I actually I just, do. I actually do know the answer, but tell yeah, the of course you what, what you um, owned. <laughs> so the, the, nine, the, the latest one's a 924 Turbo, um, which is a, like I call it a champagne green, but I actually just sold that car. Oh, you um, sold it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because yeah, I was going to talk about week. that because I actually – this is this is where it's a small world. Like I watched that video. This is the other thing oh, that yes. made me think yeah. that, hang on, I, I think I've seen something before. And then I realized on Out, – it's Outlaw Garage, isn't it, the guy from that's, that's correct, Dubai. Yeah. So if you go to Outlaw Garage on YouTube um, – I think it's a, I don't know if it's a new channel. It's a guy from Dubai that's moved back to Australia, to Perth, I think, is it? Or Melbourne? Or, uh, no, Scott, he's, he's back here in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, so he's moved to Melbourne. So, yes, he was in Dubai for a while um, and he moved back to Melbourne. And, yeah, we, we, we made a video on the 924 a couple of weeks ago. So um, tell, tell everyone about the 924, the year, the colour, and, and what, spe- what was special about it. I didn't realise you'd sold it. I was going to – but yeah, what I'm was not, special I, about that That only just happened. <laughs> Um, so it was, what was it, an 81 924 Turbo. Um, okay. And those, those cars here in Australia, you know, there weren't a great amount sold uh, from new and they were quite expensive. Um, so I had found this one and it was a rare, a very rare colour. I think it was called Inari Silver or whatever. Mm-hmm. I call it Champagne Green. Mm-hmm. And it was originally a two-tone car, so the bottom part of the car would have been darker green than the, the, the top part. Um, so, you know, quite a rare car and, and, and you know, very well looked after. And, um, you know, the, the previous owner had a new cylinder head and new turbo and all that sort of business. So, you know, quite well looked after. And 
I just like it. It's a little small, um, small fun car, small run around that that's got some, you know, eighties turbo, eighties turbo lag, the famous turbo yeah, lag from the yeah. eight. And just the, an amazing. But sound. the transaxles are, are quite. They're still quite reasonable price wise, right? Even in Australia, they're yes. not too bad. They're starting, you know, nine four four turbos are getting up there, but yep. nine two eights are getting up there, but. Is it a good purchase for someone that hasn't had a Porsche before? Is it you think that it's a good choice to go straight into a front engine? Yeah, it certainly is a good choice. I mean, a 924 Turbo is 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 a beautiful turbo car and you, you certainly get all that turbo essence of, of the Porsche era of the 80s. Um, you know, if you can afford a 944 Turbo, 968, well, you know, I don't think not many people can afford the 968 Turbo or Turbo RS, that's for sure, but did you um, see they were quite a special car? Did you see um, James the nine six eight Club Sport for sale in Riviera Blue, in classic yes. throttle shop? Yes, yes, that's quite, so beautiful, I, quite a beautiful car. I know the previous owner, and I know I know who's obviously purchased that now. Okay, um, oh, it's sold, has it? Yeah, yeah, it sold immediately. Yeah, that's a beautiful um, car. Yeah, so I'm I'm on a Porsche forum here in Australia called. Uh, Porsche Forum Australia. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and there was plenty of talk about it, and one guy traded in his, I think, 996 Carrera 4 for that car. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no, no, a beautiful car, and I'd love to own one, but uh, at that sort of price point, I think I'd be going back to a like a, an early 996 GT3. Right. But your, your 924 Turbo, which you've, which you've sold... Yep. That color would have been one of the special program. Like it's it's almost like an exclusive manufacturer now, isn't it? That special program yeah, that they yeah. had where they picked the colors because it was a two tone color. Um, but yes. I, I recommend everyone to go and look at that look at that video of James's X car now um, because it really is a it really is a nice looking uh, nine two four. That color was pretty special. Would have been very special in the two tone. I can see it's not everyone's taste, and and that's probably the reason why it was changed, right? Uh, yeah, I think the one of the previous owners had damaged some part of the lower front of it and they just painted the whole bit the whole car the same color but so, yeah it was a you know, amazing color so we've talked about air cooled we've talked about transaxle yep. water cooled and we've talked about water cooled because you had the 997 gt3 that you put on the track what about a a, 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 a road car daily a, yeah daily uh, Not, yeah cooled. definitely um do you have one have you had one i have um uh, and it is literally one of my favorites apart from its obviously failings in anyway it's a 996 carrera 2 so okay. um the early ones being the 98 model so they've got the uh the orange little um, indicators yes um so only that year had that orange sort of indicator and the, the cable throttle and all that sort of business um very very basic car um mine was um Less, like it had a sport package on it from factory. Okay. So it had the slight lower suspension, um, had the sport seats that were basically the GT3 touring seats. Yes. So all that was fact, factory optioned in. Um, an amazing, amazing type of car. That's it's, the white one, is it? Is that the white? Yeah, a white Carrera too. Which actually looks, I mean, check out um, James's Instagram, but I have to say, there's something really nice about the. I I didn't realize how good the 996, especially the early one, that's 98. It's a 98 model, right? Looks um yeah. looks in white. It looks um, it yeah, looks fantastic, white, doesn't it? It does something to the lines of that car that just make it look even better. I think. Yeah, the the white one for me. I mean, I, I wouldn't have bought it if it wasn't white. Um, it just it looks amazing. I, I quite like the shape of the 996. Um. And, and the way that car drove, you know, it was a six-speed manual and the 3.4 litre was a quite quite a torquey, revvy engine. Um, and it was just just a beautiful, beautiful car to drive. But, you know, you got that thing in the back of your mind. The old the thing story. In, yeah, the thing in the back of your mind. Yeah. So when you when you looked for this 996, you particularly wanted a 0.1, right? You wanted an early model. Yes. And yes, was there definitely. any reason why you didn't want the Mark II? I uh, just wanted the, well, the Mark I uh, 98 model was actually lighter than any of the other 996s. Okay, so it's the so weight. So the weight reduction um, and that particular engine, you know, very revvy engine and, and the car gets up and sings and, you know, anything that's light feels, you know, feels quite 
quite joyful to drive. So um, the point one, does it feel more like an air-cooled experience or not? Um, oh, that's, yeah, that's is it a, that's is a, it the lightness and the and the engine being the three point four? Does it feel more like it is? It's, a bit? it's better to drive than the nine nine three. That's for sure. Better to drive. You know? Okay. Well, that's oh, interesting. Way better. Wow. Way better than a nine nine three. Um, you can throw them around. You can do anything you want with them. They are just so lovely to drive. Um, but you know, again, the sport package makes that difference. The standard one, I don't know about, but the sport package that my car had, and I had I had so, really, um, re- renewed all the shock absorbers, and so everything felt brand new. Oh, uh, right. Okay. So the sport um, package was just different shocks and 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 lowered. Is that what it was from the factory on that? Yeah, moment? it was the. You know what they call the M, you know, what is it, M zero three zero, whatever they call it. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, springs are slightly stiffer and lower. Yes. Uh, shock shock absorbers are obviously you know better than the standard ones or stiffer than the standard ones, whatever that is. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a lot better to drive. You had the sports seats as well. The car felt light. Yep. Um, yeah, just a ripper. But just you upgraded the um, you upgraded the suspension, did you, or you just replaced it with stock? No, no, standard, just standard. completely standard. Okay. I, I like them. I like them to be standard. Okay. Um, put some R spec tires on it, so that made it a whole lot better. Yep. Um, of course, didn't expect the you know the tires to last that long, but it didn't really matter. Um, you so want to I get, get the experience the, out of it. I get the feeling you don't have this car anymore. No, certainly not. Um, <laughs> I. <laughs> I replaced the um, – I did the IMS, you know, yep. rear main seal, IMS clutch. You know, while you're in there, you do everything. Yep. Um, you know, that co- that cost quite a bit. Um, and that's, I think, when I, I sold that car and then ended up buying the white 997 GT3 road car. Ah, uh, the white 997. Because so up still... until that point, yep. I'd never had a road-going GT3. Ah, Okay. Yep. I'd never had one for the actual road. Yep. So, so you, um, yeah, that's when I bought that. Okay, so you still – wow, that 996, I just saw the rear shot that you've got on your Instagram. That 996 in white, James, it looks uh, it looks really cool, doesn't it? It looks really, mm. really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the GT3, my mate Steve that does the podcast with me, he actually has a – in Sydney, he has a 997.1 GT3 as well. Yep. Uh, he loves that car. It's a fantastic car. I mean, I drove it once, but it's it's just the, such a different experience to driving a base uh, 997 Carrera, yes. that's for sure, yep. especially when it's got a numeric shifter in it and it's a short shift and that yes. notchiness yep. and the mechanical you know, nature of it, it's just amazing. Um, so you still have the GT3? No, I don't. I sold that to a guy in Sydney. <laughs> so there's another trend here, James. It seems like the longer it goes down your progression of your Porsche history, you don't keep cars for very long. Because we're in no, we're in 2014 to 2020 here, and it seems like you're getting cars and you're selling them after what a year? Oh, less than that. Um, I think the GT3 only lasted six months, if that. So um, why did you get rid of it? What was the reason? You didn't enjoy it? Uh, well, in yeah, in one word, yeah, I didn't enjoy it. Um, okay. Uh, too much of a road car and not enough of a track car. So, I mean. You know, it, it's something I wouldn't I wouldn't have taken on the track because I've I've done that before, um, and then obviously you can't you know, going from a cup car back to a road going GT3 is not going to be that great, um, and it was just too much of a road car. It was too rough, and you know, yeah, sure, I I enjoyed it. I understand what they're about. I had had enough of them to know what they're about, but it just you know after that four or five month period, it's just like I really don't need this car. Is this you know, and, and, is yeah, this the problem though? Is this the problem though that you're going to have now because you are you know because you because you've raced because you've driven cup cars? Is this it's hard to find the balance of what you want on the road? Like, do you want more of an experience on the road than speed, or you still want the speed? What, what, what is it that you look for now when you look for a Porsche for the road? Because I guess it's like you just said, you know, you got sick of it after five months. It's a bit, you know. Yeah, it was too aggressive, and you know, putting. You know, putting the little one in the in the front seat because obviously there's no back seats, and we could legally do that here. Yes. So putting her in the seat, the, you know, my little five year old, and it's just too rough, and you just can't do anything with the car. But 
what I look for now is experience. Like that 924 was a beautiful car just to feel the, the feel of the car the way it was. Yep. Um, I think my favourite car for the road is just a basic 911 SC. You know, for me that – Okay. That's, that's all I need as a – I mean, it's not a daily car. It's it's your, your second car or third car, whatever you want, want it to be. But um, for me to have a Porsche, um, I think they're just so basic. They're, there's plenty of them around. Um, and I just like it because they're, they're not, you know, they're not overly fast and they're just a good cruising car. I, I quite like that. But the GD3 was just too much of a, a road car. And not enough of a track car, so yeah, the GD3 went. I did buy another Cup car, um, which I still own, and I'm restoring that right now. Okay. And slowly, slowly, I will start looking for uh, maybe an SC or whatever else. Might so you own the that's, you that's own reasonable. an SC? Sorry, you own an SC now, or you don't own an SC? No, I don't. No, no. What no, year I'm, would I'm back? What year would you buy an SC? What is the pick of the years in those cars? You think? Oh, I don't think it really matters. I mean, Doesn't you know, they were, they were they were produced from seventy eight to eighty two, eighty three, something there. Um, whatever comes along, that that is not you know a crazy price. Would you buy a left like hand it it left hand version? Uh, I I would if it was dramatically cheaper. Okay. Um, I've had them before in left hand drive, so that's not really a that much of a concern. But I mean, if you're paying the same sort of money as a right hand drive, you Obviously, go for the right-hand drive. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so no SC. That's on. That's on the books. That's coming. Um, the so. <laughs> the yellow. So, what's the car we have now? The yellow car, right? The yellow cup car. So that's a two thousand three uh, GD three cup car, nine nine six, of course. So that's uh, Peter Fitzgerald's um, former car. So he was um, and still does a lot of racing in in club. Uh, events here in Victoria. Yeah, he's, he's well known, well known in Australia, right? Very well known. Quite a well known yep. Porsche uh, driver in Australia. Um, he's been driving Porsches since I think probably the seventies. I, I might have that wrong, but it's definitely the seventies, maybe even earlier. Um, yeah, quite a well known uh, Porsche driver, and uh, um, you know he's won quite a few championships in uh, in Porsche racing in in various different Porsche categories here in Australia, and. Um, yeah, I think you know, literally in the '90s and 2000s, he was the the go-to guy to set your car up for uh, for racing. And you know, alongside there was there was obviously other workshops that did that, but he runs Fitzgerald Racing Services. He has that still um, now, right? He has a workshop, right? You yeah, can take yeah, yeah. He's still got it now. Yeah. So, were you involved yeah. with his team with the Porsche racing side of it? Were you you said Porsche racing, and we haven't actually we've talked about track days. And mm. were you involved with that yeah. team or? So I was um, mid to late nineties. I was uh, I got a job with a uh, a private Porsche team based in Adelaide. Okay. But at at that stage, uh, I was in Melbourne. Um, and at that stage, the way it worked is that you know um, Greg, who was the team owner, um, he had two crew members in in Melbourne, two crew members in Sydney, and I think there was another two crew members in Brisbane. So he worked that he worked out that he could, you know, go to the race meetings and have his two crew members from each state join him rather than flying people back and forth. Didn't really work out that great. Um, so he ended up choosing a couple of the guys, and he ended up choosing myself, another guy here in Melbourne, Christian, who's a good friend of mine. Yeah. And um, and at that stage, another good friend of mine now, who's Andy, who used to be in Sydney, moved to Melbourne and started working at Fitzgerald's. Okay. Um, so it ended up working out that Greg had moved his car over to the Fitzgerald Racing Services workshop as a customer car. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and that, that workshop's 10 minutes down the road from, from me. Yep. Um, and we ended up being basically the crew members for, you know, a Fitzgerald customer team. Okay. So we weren't working for Fitzgerald's, we were working for the, Greg, who was the, the, the private team owner. Okay, yep. So oh, cool. we ended up doing that for a long, long time and, you know, I'm still very good friends with Greg and um, even like 15, 16 years after that had started, we'd still be crewing on 
certain Porsches that he'd be racing in historic categories and touring car masters and all that sort of stuff. Wow. Uh, James, you've been fully immersed in it, mate. You really have. Um, you really okay. have. It's, it's, it's a great story. It really is. So let's, let's, what are you driving now then? See, I'm still, you've got the, the cup car, the 997. That you're um, as a, as so a what else road car, yeah. as a Porsche road car, I have nothing because I just sold the. Um, you just sold I just it. Sold the, I just okay. sold the nine two four turbo. Okay, why did you sell that car? Was there? I'm I'm gearing up to buy probably another SC. Um, you know, okay. I just want to. So you know, I'm gearing up for for. Uh, I've got to you know, you, when you want when you find something, you have got to have the funds ready to buy. Um, so no and, regrets selling that car. Because you only just, what did you just sell it last week or something? Uh, yeah, it was literally last week. Yeah, <laughs> okay. um, not not really any regrets. I mean, I I'd love to keep them all, but it's you simply can't. Um, you know, if if I had kept all my cars, I'd have quite a big collection. There's no way I could afford them. Um, so you know, as I've always said, one car feeds into the next, or if not, two smaller cars will feed into one better one. And I guess um, the cup car purchase would have been an expensive purchase, right? The, the GT3 wouldn't have been a cheap purchase either. Um, not, not compared to a road-going GT3, no. They're, yeah. they're, they are dramatically cheaper than a, a road-going GT3. Right, okay. Um, it's, not, it's not overly expensive and, and, and certainly not uh, cheap by any means. Um, I, look, I, probably a 911 SC costs more than the cup car now. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I picked that up, um, late last year or early this year and, you know, to basically give it a full restoration, um, body wise and get all the, the original signage back on it, exactly how Peter had it in basically 2004. So you have, you have all these people in Melbourne that you go to, all these specialists, all these guys that you know that, that can do this for you. So what part do you do yourself usually? What do you normally do yourself for the... Like the cup car, what would you work on? Um, anything, basically anything that's not, you know, paint body-wise okay. or deep into the mechanicals like internals of engines or gearboxes. Okay. Everything else I would do, um, suspension, you know, all the little bits and pieces that, that, that need to be rectified, I'll do all that. Um, okay. But I won't, I won't go and pull an engine apart or things like that. You just, you just send that off to the guys that do it every day. The guys that know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what's the what's the plan for the Fitzgerald car then? Are you planning to get back into the track again? You're planning to do more track days yes. or yeah? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, on January nine, there's a track day already booked up at Winton. Okay. Um, which is two hours or two and a half hours north of Melbourne. Yes. Um, that's with the the Porsche Forum um, Australia. So they've organised uh, just for thirty five guys to do a track day, and it's also a uh, uh, basically, uh, anyone can turn up with a Porsche and just, you know, park it in the, you know, car park and just walk around. It's just a private track day. Oh, that's great. Um, but, but all the Porsche Forum guys are, are, are going to be there. Um, I'll be partaking in the track activities. Um, it's not a time day. It's just a, as the guys have put it, it's a day at the track. It's not wow. a track day. So if you're, if you're in Australia, you can go there and, and just watch that? You can... Or you have to be a member of the Porsche Forum Australia. You can't. Well, you don't have to be a member, but uh, you know, it'd be nice if everyone was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly look at the the Porsche Forum um, uh, Australia website, and um, I'll put the I link the into the podcast are... description. It's PFA. I'm a mem- I'm I'm on it. I just don't go on it very often. Um, PFA yeah, yeah. PFA.com.au, isn't it? I think something I like think that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the guys are calling the day uh, cars and cabernet. Oh, fantastic! So it's not it's not cars and coffee because one of the major sponsors is a a wine merchant. Oh, that's even better, <laughs> even better. Yeah, because Porsche, Porsche Forums Australia, you also have the the hanger banger thing too, right? I remember that was coming up, and I remember someone sent me an email about that. Yeah, for the first yeah, one. So I this, think. yeah, this essentially is well, it's not officially the third one, but you could call it that if you want. Okay. It's not essentially a hanger banger, but yeah, that's just an event where you know. People have warehouses and, uh, you know, we just park Porsches in all funny places and look at them all day. Sounds good. Um, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be there, that's for sure. I can't wait to get back to Australia, um, James. I'm sort of, we're working in Bahrain, but I'm kind of stuck here. I mean, we usually come back to Australia a couple of times a year and um, because yeah. of COVID I haven't yep. been able to. So, But I'm planning sure. that I'm definitely going to get my, 
997, I'm definitely going to drive either north or south as far as I can go. So that's the plan. <laughs> I'm going to get in there awesome. and just put the miles on there and just and just drive. So that's what that's what yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to eventually. Hey, um, yeah. speaking about that actually, and I always ask people this depending on where they come from in the world. Um, road car, Porsche road car, 911. What is yep. the drive that you would say to people if you're coming to Melbourne or you're coming to Australia? What what road would you say this is this is the car where you you can really experience a, a 911? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I'm not a huge road going. Uh, no, like I don't go on big road going drives, but I like the Yarra Valley. Um, that might sound a bit lame, but I like the Yarra Valley. I, I don't live far from it. Yep. Um, I just enjoy the countryside out there. There are plenty of roads if you want to go up into the hills um, and do all the little twisty, you know, mountain roads. There's plenty of them out there, but I, I just enjoy driving out there. But I, I like to go out there for a reason, not just go out there for a drive and come back. Okay. Um, my, my, good, my good friend Andy that we used to work on all these Porsche teams together with, he lives out there, so there's uh, no better excuse than going to his place. And your friend has a 911 as well, Andy? Uh, not a road guy. He's got a couple of cup cars. Cup cars. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, James. Anything else? Anything else you want to tell the listeners? I think we've um, we've had a great chat today. I think people are going to really enjoy this one. No, uh, you know, there's always more stories, but um, just enjoy your cars and yeah, don't keep them in garages. <laughs> That's a good point. And if you're looking for a 911, just you know, if you can't. Buy the one you can afford because you're still going to enjoy yeah. it, correct? Or Porsche yeah, or whatever. Buy the one you enjoy that you can afford. Get one, and then you know at least start somewhere. And I think that's the I think that's a important thing. But I think you know a lot of people are going to listen to your story and go, "Wow, it's a you've experienced to be able to experience it on track days, to be able to experience a cup car, to own you know two cup cars now. I guess yeah, two with the Fitzgerald oh, one, three, three, three better. Oh, that's right, yeah, three. There was yeah. a, there was another one in there. But, There's an, you know. where's he, hang on, so we missed one. Uh, there was another one, another 2004 uh, 996 Cup car, um, too cheap to refuse. Uh, so I, I, I bought that and did one track day in it and then sold it. And Really? It wasn't, what you, it wasn't as good as the first one? or? No, no, it was, I mean, just a cheap car. I mean, I had two of them at that stage. There's no point keeping two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you obviously have a big garage in your house or you, you store them somewhere else when you have all these cars? Um, <laughs> my, par- my parents have quite a big I do garage. That. <laughs> okay. Okay. And here's one last question because this one I, I, I don't normally ask people, but out of all the cars you've owned, which is the one you regret selling? My, uh, the, the, the Carrera 3 litre. Um, I don't – well, it's two sides to that story. I don't regret selling it, but I would love to. I'd love to still own it. Um, the reason I say I don't regret selling it is because it allowed me to buy, uh, I think, three cars after that. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, not not crazy expensive cars, but three lower price cars. Um, but I would still love to own that car because it was literally brand new, and and just the way that car drove was oh, just an amazing experience. The, the the Carrera three liter engine is just a very special engine. Right. Um, it's it's definitely not the same as a an SC. Um, more more akin to a a two point seven MFI. There's always mm-hmm. that argument between the two point seven MFI and the Carrera three liter engine. Yep. Um, I don't have a great amount of experience with the MFI engine, but the Carrera three engine is just oh, the way that thing drove was just amazing. Fantastic. Uh, and the way it looked and, you know, the 15-inch wheels and the yeah, Fuchs yeah, wheels, you know, yeah. a bit of a deep dish on them, they were just beautiful. Yeah. So that's the one. All yeah. right, James. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, so I want everyone, uh, if you're interested in seeing all the cars uh, that James has owned, go to his Instagram, uh, Porsche or Porsche Platz, Platz, P-L-A-T-Z. I'll put the link in the description of this podcast. Uh, there's lots of photos. So go over to Instagram there. Um, Check out James's page and give him a follow. Um, there's lots of things to look at. Um, but thanks so much, James. Really appreciate you spending uh, the Sunday evening and, and, and chatting on the Porsche School podcast. It's been great. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I've, uh, I've quite enjoyed it. But um, I really, you know, it's, it's great to hear your story. It really is great to hear your story. And I'm glad we actually caught up because I know we messaged, messaged each, each other like ages ago. Um, so I'm glad yeah, we, yeah. Um, it came to fruition. 
All right, everybody. Um, thanks for listening to the Porsche Cool Podcast. This has been Owner's Stories. Uh, that's James from Melbourne. Like I said, check out his Instagram, Porsche Platts. Um, and we'll talk again soon. Bye for now. Oh.